Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Animast, welcome to the presentation section of the festival. And um, in this uh, rainy afternoon, we have a great honor and pleasure to have here our members of the jury of this year for feature film and Romania competition. And one of the great uh, women in animation that still are in, that came to Bucharest actually, and uh, a great pleasure to have Joanna Quinn here. Joanna, welcome, and thank you. <laughs> and thank you for being with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. So, um, yes, hello everybody. Uh, so what I thought I'd do today is, um, because a lot of you are students, um, uh, I know it's going out on uh, Facebook, so whatever, but I'm aiming it at you lot. I thought I'd be a bit more specific because um, because you're students, so it's more like a, just showing you how I work. So um, what I was going to do is really talk about observation, how I break down movement, and uh, talk about lip sync, how I do lip sync, and that's all actually. And so uh, I've got I've got lots of artwork here, and I was going to show you how I actually physically animate. And uh, yes, I still work on paper. Um, but I did, for the last film, I don't know how many of you seen Affairs of the Art. Um, it was on earlier in the week. But uh, that was actually animated on paper. But I did animate on um, TV paint for about six months. But then I really missed my paper. So I, I went back in time to the olden days and I got out my light box and carried on doing it on paper. But uh, I did um, use TV paint to do the colouring and, uh, and then After Effects to put it all together. So um, what, uh, what I was going to do first is show you um, a little show reel of all of our films, just so you get an idea of what we do. We've got a company called Barrel Productions in Cardiff in Wales. And it's me and my partner, Les Mills, and he, he's the producer and writer. And I'm the drawer and director. And, um, and then obviously when we've got jobs, we bring more people in and it becomes a bigger team. But uh, I'll, just, um, I'll just show you the little show reel. So we've made about, uh, probably about six short films. We've made a half hour film uh, for children and we've done over a hundred commercials. So it's sort of balancing stuff. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm on somebody else's computer. Hang on a minute. Oh, just, sorry. My name is Bella 
Well, yes, you all know me. I represent the girls on assembly. So you think I'm just a party, but there's more to me than Nazi. So I prove it to you now with the greatest of ease. <laughs> you better quit those seeds for you burst into tears. When you're beaten by a woman who is twice your years, they're gonna put you in your place to wipe the smile right off your face. And now it's time to see you get the biggest cheers. Because you're gonna lincy wincy is the pace too much for you to bear? It looks a bit embarrassing for you, keeps harassing Ooh. all the girls from up a year to down by bear. <laughs> See, my body is mine, so let me be. Skelly fat, tall, or muscly. And I don't care what you think, because when I'm stood, you're in the pink. I'm proud of every pound, and I don't want to shrink. So come on, all you women, you got nothing to fear. Forget about your fingers, body, beauty, body. <laughs> so that's just a, like a little mishmash. <laughs> um, so just to give you a little bit of a background about me, uh, I was brought up in London and um, I went to school, obviously, uh, but I was always obsessed with drawing. So ever since I was little, um, so I was an only child for a long time until I got half brothers and sisters, uh, brothers, but I never lived with them. And... Um, so I spent a lot of time alone, the story of an animator, and, uh, and actually um, my, my parents were going through a divorce for as long as I could uh, remember, and so I used to get away with a lot, you know, um, because they were always nice to me to make up for their relationship, and uh, so I used to be allowed to draw on the walls of my bedroom, and so that is in the film in Affairs of the Art when she's drawing on the walls. So all my walls were covered in my drawings. And, uh, and then one year, my mum bought me an easel, and I was six. I don't think it was a very expensive easel, but it was an easel. And um, uh, like a, um, what do you call it, a, a blackboard with some chalk. And so I would put it in the window and draw outside. Uh, so doing observational drawing. And so I would draw. And then, of course, I'd have to rub it out, unlike the drawings on my wall, because they stayed there. But if I wanted to do another drawing on this blackboard, I'd have to rub it out. So I'd, I got used to rubbing things out very quickly and not getting precious about my drawings. So that's animation. <laughs> <laughs> and people used to ask me when I was little, say, what do you want to do? And I really wanted to go to prison, you know? <laughs> And I said, I want to go to prison um, because I thought it was just like heaven because you could just be in a cell, draw on the walls and just draw all day and nobody would, for years, you know, and nobody would. Anyway, several decades later, it came true. I became an animator, <laughs> which is like being in prison for six years making a film. So... Uh, yeah, anyway, I went to college. Um, I, dis I wanted to do graphic design because I didn't really know about animation. Uh, I, I, I knew Tom and Jerry and that was it. And I thought that was a whole other world. It was America, you know, it was nothing to do with, with my upbringing or anything. <clears throat> but I did, I did like doing funny drawings and I did like doing comic strips. So I was always drawing and trying to make people laugh. And I decided to choose graphic design. So I went to college to do graphic design, thinking I could do, because I like photography as well, thinking I could do photography and uh, uh, comics and um, illustration work. And then in the first year on the course, we were giving an animation project. And, uh, and it was like, oh, my God, you've got to do all those drawings. <laughs> For one second, it's fantastic. So that was it. I just thought this is just the best thing ever. And so uh, my graduation film was called Girls' Night Out, which I'm not going to show, but have you seen Girls' Night Out? It's about a woman going to a male stripper. And um, so that was my graduation film, and it won prizes at Annecy, and, and it was like, oh, my God, animation's fantastic. I love this world. But uh, what I wanted to show you was actually my very first piece of animation, because you're students. Um, 
So Girls' Night Out wasn't really my first piece of animation. It was my first film, but I did a little little animated sequence when I was in the first year at uh, university. So I thought I'd just show you that. It's so short, do not blink or you'll miss it. Um, and because uh, I was doing life drawing as well. So I was life drawing and I really wanted to just animate the model. So this is, I'll just show you this. Oops. There we go. Terrible quality, I have to say. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so that was like the first little piece of animation I did. And uh, I think it was, um, but I did, so I did that in the first year. And I just, I just thought animation was wonderful. You know, I really had from that moment discovered that that's what I wanted to do forever. Um, and, uh, and I did, and I have done it forever actually, literally forever. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm not going to show you all my films because uh, we haven't got long. So I'm going to go ahead now and show you a film that I made in, uh, oh, oh, I can't remember when I made it, but um, it was about my uh, third film or fourth, third film. And um, the reason I like it and want to show it is because it was the first film that I really felt like I learned how to animate properly, you know, or, or that um, I started to animate in a different way. I think up until the film that I'm going to show you, I got used to doing what other people were doing, which was Im using your imagination, imagining your, your animation sequence, drawing it, then testing it, and then analyzing the movement after you tested your animation and then redoing your animation. But um, when I did this film called L, I, I didn't have a line tester with me. I was in Spain and I, had, I didn't have a line tester and I only had three months to do it. So I had to keep it very simple and um, realize that I had to analyze the movement before I put pencil to paper because I couldn't test it. So I really had to understand the movement before I animated. So I'll, I'll show you that film and then I'll talk about it afterwards. Oh, it's based on a, a, a Toulouse-Lautrec work, which I will explain.
<laughs> um, just to explain, I didn't explain what that was. Um, I was asked by producer Didier Brunner, who's a French um, producer, and he was making um, a film made up of, I think, five short little animated films for a Toulouse-Lautrec exhibition in Paris. And so he had asked different animators to make little films based on a painting or a drawing or something. And so that's what that was. But, I, but it was also um, that I didn't have very long to do it. And so I decided instead of it being like full color, like my previous films, um, I would do it like to lose the Trek sketchbook, you know, so that, that was the idea. And then I wouldn't have to worry about backgrounds and color and all of that. And uh, so um, what I wanted to just show you is just some of the studies that, uh, I did I'll just open this in preview. So for instance, like the scissors drawing. So for all my films, I've got sketchbooks, lots and lots of sketchbooks with lots of studies. Um, you know, try, just the observational studies. And I think when, when you're doing, uh, you know, observational stuff and you're, you're looking for moments where the direction of action changes, you know, so you're really, you're looking for the key drawing, the key moment. Um, and so like I've, I've numbered these like two and three one, two, three. So they were like significant things. And so that's a, that's an actual drawing. That was a rough. And then I thought, I like it. So I put it into the sequence and just moved the peg bar because um, if you keep the original drawings, they're always nicer than if you trace them, you know, and then try and you always lose something every time you trace something. And this is the corset, you know, like da, 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 trying to, whoops trying to work out the key moments. And that's the final one. That's the final drawing. So that is that drawing. Do, do, do. So what I would do is act it out or get somebody else to act it out until I really, really understood the movement. And, and you can see the rhythm in the action. La, 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 da, 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 And those are your key drawings, you know. And so that you draw those in your sketchbook. Da, da, and then you look at your sketches, da, 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 da. Uh, and then on your drawing, on my light box, but on your Cintiq or whatever you're doing, those would be your clean, um, your, your key drawings. So those are the key moments of the rhythm. And that's, that's the thing that I realized after all these years is looking for rhythm in the animation. Otherwise it just goes, Doo. but if you punctuate your animation, it gives the audience time to anticipate what's coming and enjoy what's just happened, you know, if, if there's punctuation going through. So um, these are keys. And again, that's, that's that when she um, is dancing, really try, that, that really did my head in actually trying to do that. So, you know, I just sort of made it down to a bean shape, you know, so it was just do, 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 trying to work out and also working out how many drawings to do as well. How, how many drawings do you do? So then if you act it out and you say, okay, well, that took me one second to, to get from there to there, then you know if you're doing 12 drawings a second, you know you've got 12 drawings to get from there to there. So you're just, but it doesn't have to be exact. You know, you can just sort of make it up and try it and think, oh, that feels right, you know, and normally it is just right. Um, this is undoing a shoelace and uh, when she's taking her shoelaces off because it's such a complicated action. You know, the hands coming down, two hands, not one, two, which are separate, looping the lace, pulling out, and you've got 
elbows moving, you've got wrists moving, you've got fingers, you've got the floppiness of the lace. So you've got quite a lot of things to think about and to put in order. So laces last, because that's follow on animation. Um, copy the keys, you know, so that you copy the changes of direction of the wrists. And also when I'm acting it out, I'm acting it out like a silent movie person, you know, so that it's exaggerated, because otherwise you don't want to copy something that's subtle. Because uh, mm -hmm. when you animate it, animation's weird like that. If it's sort of not exaggerating, it doesn't really look uh, real, but if it's exaggerated, it looks real. Whereas if it's in, in live action, it looks over the top, but in animation, it never really looks over the top. Um, yeah, so th this is, I've broken this down to 13 different things for, for op opening the, the napkin. And they're all changes of direction. See, these are things that if you imagined it and you didn't actually look, it wouldn't be very interesting because it's so complicated and, uh, you know, the, your audience is very sophisticated and if it looks wrong, it, they'll know it's wrong, you know. So you have to give your audience reality, but then extra, you know. So, so everything, but what I do, everything is based on observation and then with a little bit of Barclay animation dust on the top. And these are, this is an example of, uh, so those are the rough sketches and these are the final keys that I've, I've done. So I've just, so when I'm drawing, I'll uh, look at the roughs and then do the key. The com the, the, so I, I'm not, I'm not going to stick it on my paper. I redraw it. Um, and I can spend hours, you know, getting that drawing absolutely right. Uh, but then the in-betweens are quite quick. You know, so but it's really important to get the the key movement as opposite to each other as possible because then it makes the journey between the keys really interesting and, and interesting to animate as well because animation can be really boring. So if the animation is interesting, it, it not only looks good, but it also keeps you entertained as you're doing it. So um what I, what I was going to show you is I've got some of the drawings here, some of these. So um, can you uh, do the camera? Ta da there we are. <laughs> so with my key drawings, let me see. So this is what I would do. So that would be drawing, drawing number one, drawing number two. And um, then literally I would just draw the one in the middle, which I think is that one. And I, I don't often use the light box to tell you the truth. I tend to, so you can see there, that's the, that's the middle drawing there. Does that work? Yeah. So that's that's the middle drawing. Um, and so going through a sequence, all of the keys, do, 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 so I've done my keys, maybe just 12 drawings or something or, or six drawings, but then go back to the beginning and uh, do the, in, the key in-betweens, the main in-betweens all the way through and go back to the beginning and just fill that in. Sometimes not quite Sometimes you get stuck in one area and do a few more in-betweens, but that, that tends to be what I do. And after uh, you've animated for quite a while, you can tell that, that that gap with that hand, the difference between that and that is too big. That's a bit of a jump. Um, so I know I need to do an in-between between between that just to smooth it out because it's too big a, big a jump. That one's not too bad, but since they're on the same sheet of paper, then... You have to do it. So, uh, so the drawing in between that would be that one there. So that's now the in between. And just to show you, I mean, all I really do 
is, uh, oh, it's under here, some paper, which is far too big, but never mind. Um, so when I'm animating, I think I don't use the light box because my drawings are the final drawings. And, and so I think I approach it slightly differently. You know, I'm looking for the drawing as well as the positioning. I always use a light box when it's a really tiny, tiny difference and you can't see it, you know, and so then you have to be quite careful to, to be able to see the gaps between the drawings to trace. But this, this is how I would, I would just look. So I'm looking at this hand, so I'm ignoring this half of the drawing and literally, that finger goes to, so if I flick it, that finger goes to there. And so you remember, so it was, it was there and it's going to there. And so the middle position would be there-ish. The thumb is there, there, so I put it there. The other finger there. Of course, you know, you re remember that this has happened so quickly that even if it's not right, it doesn't matter, nobody's going to see it. But, uh, <laughs> and then maybe the, that goes there. Let's see where the knuckles are. Hmm, sort of there-ish. And I tend to draw with the side of the pencil as well, because it's more fluid. I might just leave it like that for now because you want to crack, crack on. You're just trying to get the rough idea of where it is. You know, hands are notoriously hard, so I probably go back afterwards and just um, make sure it looks all right. Knuckles, knuckles, knuckle, knuckle, there ish. Oh, and I use a putty rubber and rub out because then I like putty rubbers because they, they leave a trace of what was there before. So even though it's wrong, it's a mess, which is nice. <laughs> it just gives it a little bit of life. And I think that's what I was missing when I was working on TV paint being able to keep that mess. I didn't realize how important mess was to me. And as well, you know, the, the line. So because there's a, a bend there, I make that nice and dark but the fingers are moving so I wouldn't make the line too dark because it's movement I don't want them to jump out I want that that to feel like movement because otherwise I mean what you're yeah what you're trying to create is movement in life a movement in life is is uh you know we only really see something when it stops the movement is just movement and that's what we're trying to replicate by not making it solid, not making your in-between drawings too solid. Only when it's hanging around, and then it needs to be more solid. It was very badly explained. <laughs> so, so then I'd take it out and put it this way round, and then I can see if it works and it doesn't because I'm doing it in front of you. I once did a walk cycle in front of a whole load of students and when I filmed it, it was backwards. So <laughs> that was very embarrassing. They thought it was hilarious. <laughs> so, uh... okay, imagine that was really good. Then, <laughs> uh... 
Um, I notice, you know, a lot of animators work differently. And there's like an in pile, do pile, out pile. You sort of work in that direction and do the in-betweens, put them over there. But what I like to do is to pile all the drawings up on so they never leave the peg bar, which is also why it's difficult to use the light box because you can't see through them. And the reason I like to do that is to make sure the volume stays the same. So if you pile up all of the drawings, you can always flick back to the first one and just make sure it hasn't shifted. Because you know like when you do a flick book and, and you draw one drawing and move it and, and it all sort of goes off the page, it's very easy to do that in animation unless you quickly refer back and you know, plan your animation so that you compare your first drawing with your last drawing and make sure it hasn't gone over or unless of course that's part of the plan. So now what I can do is I can see all of the drawings together and flick them and test the movement that way. Without having a light, without having a, a tester. I mean, you can't test the whole movement, but you can test it like little sections and doing it that way. Okay, right. So next, next, what I was going to talk about was um, lip sync. If anybody's got any questions? Just shout while I'm doing this. No, this is the final drawing. So um, for this film, this is the final drawing. Like for the last film, um, uh, the, the scenes that I did, I animated the final drawings. Uh, but I used animators as well. There were different animators who worked on it. And I said to them, um, you know, work in your own style because animators, you know, we're all people and everybody has their own way of drawing and it's really difficult to copy somebody's style so as much as people try it's quite hard and and when they're drawing characters I notice they all draw themselves which is really funny so <laughs> if they're short the characters come out all short and if they're so tall but all but so so you sort of prioritize what you're looking for in an animator and I think what I'm looking for mainly the people I work with I want humor you know so I want the ability to make a character act and be funny and because that's the most important thing so they animate in their style so what i would do is give them a layout so for instance i would say okay i, I maybe give them three of these the first the middle and the last and i said this is your layout uh these are your layouts for this scene go away and animate it we time it all so i'd give them um a dope sheet good old-fashioned dope sheet so that they can see how many frames so each each line is a frame of action and if there's any words it goes down the side and so they can fill this in as they're going along and um, then I get their drawings back and of course they don't look anything like my drawings and they get tested but the, but normally the animation is great so then what I do is I take their drawings, I then go through and pick out the main drawings and trace them, but in my style. So it, and then, so I do as many as I can, and then I normally work with. Um, uh, uh, I've got a particular Marcy Rojas who's um, just fantastic, and I've worked with her for years, and she is really good at taking somebody else's drawing putting it there. I've got my drawings either side. She takes their in-between, their, their, yeah, their animation drawing, and she can do the in-betweens in my style, if you see what I mean. So, and then at the end of all of that, I take it, I put it on my light box and I go through every single drawing, just sort of, um, we call it quinifying. We quinify, <laughs> we quinify all the drawings. And then, um, then it looks like I've done it and I get all the credit. So, <laughs> uh, so that's how I sort of work with other people. 
and, and, and I really like taking somebody's animation and quinifying it. I love it. Because <laughs> you can get lost, you can listen to the radio and you're just doing nice drawings rather than trying to animate, you know. Because animation is actually lots and lots of tasks. It's, you know, it's so many different tasks. And you, you're not good at everything, you know, we're not all good. It's so complicated um, and it's nice to have a broad range of skills, but quite clearly everybody is good at some things and not that good at other things. And so on a team, when you're pulling a team together, you know, you're looking for people with certain skills and you, and you don't really muddle them up that much because it all goes wrong. But <laughs> um, OK, so. So observation. So that's why I was. Everything is observed. Um, keys are done in sketchbooks, translated onto the page. Each key in between, keeping the volume by by checking. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about lip sync because I I didn't want to do that much lip sync in the last film because I thought, oh my god, it's going to take forever, and my lip sync is always. Bad. I've got rubber lips, and uh, but of course, lip sync isn't lip sync. Lip sync is acting, you know. And so, I then realised I love lip sync, you know. And so, um, I just re I was like, oh, another lip sync scene! Hurrah! So, what I was going to do is just show you. Uh, this is what's that? Acting movies. Oh, this is me. Oh yes, so I did this. I did this sort of making of video, but I've just taken this section, which is me talking about uh, doing the lips um, for it's for affairs of the art when Beverly decides she, she's going to leave the Communist Party and throws the badge after singing. So she sings the Internationale. Luckily, we had a Russian-speaking intern, so, <laughs> so she did the dope sheets, which was very good. So I animated to um, those dope sheets. But anyway, I'll, I'll just play this. So once I've animated the scene uh, roughly, I try and animate as quickly as possible to keep the energy and to get the overall movement. And, and then we're going back into it and starting to do the detail. So the lip sync, the actual lip, lips, is something that I do last. So what I did as a little guide to help me is I... I, I photographed myself doing the mouth shapes and then I filmed it and um, to, to see which mouth shapes um, would coincide with um, uh, the words. So I just literally filmed that. But they only went as far as East Berlin. And so with this trusty guide um, in front of me, I do the lips. So here's the final line test. Um, it's not tidy or anything, but it's just uh, some rough lips and some rough throwing. So you can see what it looks like all roughly animated. But they only went as far as East Berlin. <laughs> so Bev quit the party. So as a treat, this is what this scene looks like when it's um, cleaned up, coloured, and with, with the correct voice on it, but rough sound effects. Anyway, I'm skipping ahead here, but it's a treat. She even joined the Young Communist League to get a free trip to Moscow to see his tomb. But they only went as far as East Berlin. So Bev quit the party. So, before I did any of the lip sync, I filmed myself um, do it. So I've got some lip sync things here, very embarrassing movies. Um, okay, so. Right, so I had the voice of the actress and I acted it out with, you know, over and over again, just using my phone, over and over again and then choosing the one that I thought had the best rhythm. So I'm moving my head and doing all, and tr trying to just choose the most interesting take. So this is, this is uh, I think, me doing it. 
and then the animation afterwards, me identifying the keys. This little girl. But that last jumper I knitted for Edie's little girl. But that last jumper I knitted for Edie's little girl. Well. So what I was looking for is doing it over and over again. Well, that last jumper I knitted and I was nodding as I was doing it. So on the dope sheet, when I was writing it down, I would put a cross where the punctuation was and, and I realised it's always on the vowels, you know? It's always... Da, 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 da. It tends to be on the vowels, which is... It's not a rule, but it's just something that I've noticed. That last jumper I knitted for Edie's little girl. You know, it's, all, it's always old, old girl, girl. So that's a sort of vowel. Um, so I would animate the, the body before doing the lips. Or maybe I would do the lips in the keys just to... But, but, it's, but it is actually about the rhythm that the voice creates and, and the way the body acts it out. And that's what you're looking for when you're filming yourself and that rhythm and putting that in and, it, and in the same way that I was doing it before then you just do the in-betweens you know so it's uh and I've got another one this is Iva because of course I had to do all the characters what's this Op opened it by mistake did you love <laughs> what's this Op opened it by mistake did you love <laughs> Op open it by mistake, did you love? <laughs> <laughs> open it by mistake, did you love? <laughs> What's this? Op open it by mistake, did you love? <laughs> Op open it by mistake, did you love? <laughs> See, that is actually really complicated. It's a really... Because if I had made it up, I just would have had him look inside. But by acting it out... He goes, what's this? So it's, he pulls away before he goes. Then he goes, he looks in, and then he goes, ho, ho, ho. But that, this is doing something else. So it goes away together, then shows it, ha, ha. And so by, by filming yourself and then look, analysing the, the video, you can, you're looking at the packet. What happens with the packet? Where's the rhythm in the movement of the packet? And where does it go? And then noting it on your dope sheet, you could just write hand, da, da, da. you know, you could have a rhythm section just for the hand in a particular colour. And you can do this on TV paint and, you know, just, you're just looking for the frames with the, with the action. And I know it's harder when you animate digitally, because I know. Um, and it's much easier when you do it anal in an anal analogue way because you, because it's slower and, and it's, and it's, it's, it's not as easy just to go ahead. You know, when, you did, when you're working digitally, it's very easy just to steam ahead. But doing it in an analog way, noting down where the rhythm is, it sort of stops you from just going ahead. You do a chunk and then another chunk and another chunk. And so it, it's, it's quite a good uh, thing to get into if, you, if you're animating digitally to try and think of it in chunks you know, to make sure that the rhythm is there in your animation and it doesn't just go brrrp all the way through. Um, yeah, so it's, you're, you're, you're looking at the rhythm in the box. I was looking at his head and his eyes, you know, where the eyes go, when they open, when they're, when they're shut. And, and, then, and then he talks and he laughs, ha <laughs> ha. And then the, sh the shoulders are so, the relationship between the shoulders and the head, you know, are really expressive. Um, so, ha, 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 you know, ha, ha, ha. Does he get lower as he's laughing or is that a repeat? I tend to try not to repeat to do cycles because it becomes obvious in my animation because my animation is so sort of free. If I have a cycle, it, it's, it's sort of a little bit, you can see it, when there's an action like that. So I probably wouldn't look... I, I'd make his laughter, even though it's a similar action, I think he'd probably get lower or higher just to, to keep the overall movement going. Um, okay. What's this? Oh, so, da, 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 da. So, oh, oh. There you go. so he moves back. Stick, did you laugh? <laughs> yeah, so he, he's mo moving mistake, backwards actually laugh? when he laughs. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Animation nerd. 
No, I had um, I had a w wonderful opportunity uh, before with Richard Williams, you know, the wonderful animator Richard Williams, because he lived in Bristol, which isn't too far from where I live. And uh, so um, I used to go, not, not all the time, I went a few times, to his studio and we would, he's got all his photocopies of Milk Carl's animation um, from Disney and uh, he had um, uh, stuff, he had uh, Madame Medusa with her coat, you know, uh, and he had, oh, he had just piles of these drawings and we would just sit there. He would refilm them and he and I would just sit there being total animation nerds going, <gasps> but Richard being Richard, um, he had Madame Medusa, a, a, a sequence of Madame Medusa, where she, she turns around, she grabs her coat off the chair and walks away like this. And it's the most beautiful animation, but it's on twos. And Richard did all his animation on ones. He was like an animation, I mean, a ones nutter. And so uh, he in-betweened it. He in-betweened Milk Carl's sequence and then played the two together and said, which one is the best, Joanna? <laughs> I said, oh, yours, Richard. Because <laughs> <laughs> it actually was, you know. But, of course, it's really stupid to work on ones because it's twice as much work, so... So, <laughs> uh, And I've got, I've got some other drawings here. This is from the last film, so I thought I'd do some more in-betweening. <laughs> so this was the first drawing. I'll take those hands away. So that's the... And then the middle... So if I was, let me just do an in-between. So if I was in-betweening that. Look, it, I suppose I always sort of start with eyes and glasses because they're the most obvious probably because people look at them. Nose goes there. Yes, so what you're, what you're doing is you're breaking down your animation so that the in-betweens, you don't have too much thinking to do. You know, you're just really measuring. Your thinking is in the keys. You're thinking it, the direction goes from there to there to there, and then your in-betweens are just filling in. So her hand is down there, and if there was an arc, it comes up like that, so her hand... Because, of course, you have to remember that when you're in-betweening, things move in circles and arcs, it's not just like... <laughs> no corners. So, so doing the in-betweens, I probably wouldn't act it out that much. Or maybe I would for this, just sort of pull it where, and then see where the wrist changes direction. No, oh, maybe it's higher up here. And really, I do it as rough as that. It is, it is quite rough. Lips. Doo -doo -doo. Um. with the hair because it's not part of the action. And then... This arm is just... I think it's coming up, but uh, I'll leave it there for the minute. It's really weird drawing in front of people. It's such a solitary activity, you know, it's really strange having a crowd. Mm. 
and then just her side of the face. My brows. Yeah, so all you're really doing is just looking where the middle position for each thing is. I know you have know how to in between why I'm doing this, but anyway. It's just nice to watch people work, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you uh, now it's off? Do you work with like uh, breakdowns? Like, do you favor an in between first, where you first choose the most important in between, and then yes, from there. And do you do that? Like, you think about that before you already generated your keyframes, or is that like after? I think it's after. Yeah, because you'll do the key the key in betweens. And then you think, oh, that's still too much of a gap between that. So then you put another one in. But I do use ladders, you know. So um, I've, like, here's a ladder there. There's a ladder. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so you there can you see that. So that's a key. Yeah. That's a key. That's the in between. Yeah. Yeah. But I put that one in because it, the gap between that one and that one was too big. Okay. Yeah. And then when I've got lots of in betweens, I actually put a. So so the way that we do it is um, a circle around the key drawings and then a line underneath the middle drawing. And then I also, if you've got more, is a line over the top to show the second, uh, the se the second in between. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the reason that that's really important when you've got a team is so that when the people are cleaning the drawings up or in betweening, they're doing the same they're working through the same drawings in the same direction as the animator. Mm -hmm. Because what you don't want is somebody cleaning up or going over the drawing, starting at the beginning and going to the end. Because sometimes the nuances in the acting are so subtle that you only see it when the, when the drawings are moving. Mm -hmm. You don't see timing in a single drawing. It's there when it's on the screen and it's really easy to lose it when the drawings get given to somebody else and they just put them on model. But if they follow the keys, it's less likely to go wrong because they're following the same thought pattern as the animator. So key, key, that's an in-between. Because, yeah, anyway, yes. Ladders for like sometimes just a hand, for example? Or just to have. No, but just a hand. Like, for example, you, you would, or would you do it always for the whole? No, um, if if things are moving at different times, uh, I don't tend to do that myself. But I have worked with animators who break really do break everything down, and then sometimes I ask them to do it because it's so complicated, I, or I think it's going to be really complicated for the cleanup people because everything's moving at different speeds. Uh, and I and that really helps, like when you work with really experienced animators. And because the other thing is you learn, you don't, you never stop learning. You know, I learned so much on the last film working with different people and we were all learning together and, uh, and trying things out because we didn't have a deadline, which is why it took six years, which is really, really stupid. Always have a deadline. Um, but it did mean that we had room to try stuff out and experiment and, you know, I was working with um, a graduate, Mia Rose Goddard, who we got from college. She just finished. And, you know, she learned how to, to edit, composite and, uh, you know, do everything because we had the time. And so I was saying, oh, yeah, that sort of works. Went, what do you think? You know, and so it was all like trying stuff out rather than using super professional people. It was more like extended college. It was quite nice. So, um, and I also did a, a talk recently with um, Mo, who is Richard Williams' wife uh, for the British Animation Awards. And so I was asking questions, to, I was interviewing her. And, uh, and she was just saying, you know, the one thing about Richard Williams is that he was so keen to teach 
people and he was so keen to learn. You know, he never stopped learning. And, and I think absolutely the same. You know, you never, once you leave college, it's only just started. You know, you've, there's so much to learn. And to keep yourselves, you know, really open-minded and just try everything. And the worst thing is being afraid of failure, you know, because then you don't try things out. And so, you know, be, be prepared to make loads of mistakes because it happens. And, uh, you know, just, just embrace, embrace it because it's, you know, working in animation is so fantastic. The people are lovely. The people are great. And you come to wonderful festivals. I think we're wrapping up. So, um, yeah, what's the time? Yeah, so we better start wrapping up now anyway. So if anybody's got any questions. <laughs> no? Well, thank you very much. Oh, was that a question? Or was that a waving goodbye? <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you. Um, I am studying to be a 3D animator, actually. Uh -huh. um, what would you like to teach to someone like me? Um, Perspective. Probably exactly the same thing. I mean, it depends what your, uh, you, you choose to animate, but if you are doing character animation, I think it's exactly the same. Um, it's all about observation, identifying how people act and, you know, the exaggeration of, of and body language. It's all about body language and, uh, and punctuation, you know, it's, it's, it's all the same thing, I think. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering that because uh, we've had some teachers that were a lot more into um, 3D splining and uh, really working with the 3D, but sometimes you get too lost in the technical aspects of 3D. Yeah. And you forget about really the, the 2D principles and you the, the animation. It's kind of uncanny, and mm. so a lot of animators, 3D animators, have to look back into 2D to really get good. Yeah. So mm. that's why I was asking. Like. Yeah, I I th I think as well. It's it's really easy to get stuck into the minutiae, you know, and to to get too overly involved in a, a small piece of animation or the technical side of it, and it's and it's really important to have a broader picture and to make sure you're not going away from what you originally achieved and uh, the way that I try and keep everything so that you don't go off is the um, storyboard that I do I take the storyboard I blow it up and that becomes a key drawing so I never stray that far and and the storyboard drawing is a rough drawing from my sketchbook you know so it's I try and keep it as close to the original thought and keep that original thought going through. And I always have my sketchbooks to make sure I'm not straying too far from the original idea, just as a, a reminder. Um, but I think as well, that has come from doing more directing because when you're a director, you're not really doing the animation, but you're, the bigger pic you're looking at the bigger picture, making sure all the time you haven't gone too far from the storyboard. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it, that was a good learning thing, you know, being a director. Because it, it stops you being technical and looking at different things. You're saying, you're looking at, but the story's gone wrong. You know, you're looking at a broader thing. I think it also helped me not going to animation school. Not, not that, I mean, here <laughs> Because you weren't with animators, you know, who were going, oh, look at this bit of animation. Um, you know, they were graphic designers. And it was all about communication of ideas rather than the technique. And so it, that, that was quite healthy, I think, you know. But it is hard. Thank you. Thank you. It's really funny. I feel like a tram driver. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was wondering if it's difficult to find people who work on paper now for your projects, and also if there are really differences in how do you communicate <laughs> with uh, people who do 2D animation but always did it, uh, you know, digitally and people who um, did it on paper? Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, 
Mm, let me think. There are a lot of people who want to work on paper, you know, who haven't got the opportunity. So I've got a list of people who, <laughs> you know, really want to do it. And um, I was taught, oh, what's his name? There was an animator uh, who works for a big studio and they're doing a project at the moment, so like a big feature, part drawn on paper and part done digitally because there are so many people who really want who really feel, you know, that they love draw, drawing on paper. I mean, it's the act of it is so lovely. Um, and it might be a generational thing because I was brought up with it and the people I work with also were. Uh, but um, saying that, some of the younger people I was working with, they, they're just good at drawing, you know, so they, they draw on paper. And I think the principles are the same pretty much, except there's no undo button. You know, you see people do that all the time going, ah, you know. <laughs> and then they go, oh, oh, no, it's gone. You know, and you can't undo, undo, undo and find the drawing that you've already destroyed. So, uh, yeah, no, there are, there are plenty of people. And, and when I'm teaching as well in colleges, you know, there are quite a lot of students who are getting light boxes out and, you know, wanting to do drawing on paper, because they think it's new, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is really funny. I'm so old, it's come round into fashion again. <laughs> and we'll say goodbye. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>